what I'm going to try and do is um, very ambitious, if I may say so. I'm just going to try and explain, give an overview of the, the planning system and what's proposed in the government's green paper in about 10 minutes. So, uh, if, if you're a, a planning professional or you just know a little bit about planning and you, you, you spot that I've actually left stuff out and I've missed stuff, um, you're, you're right. Because um, I'm not trying to, I can't just cover everything in that sort of time. I will, I will say I am an executive member of the Nature Conservation Council and it's part of our discussion. We've got some funding from the state government to look at the planning reforms and try and uh, inform our member groups. So that's um, largely where I'm coming from. I'm also a member of the Greens. I just want to say that up front so nobody thinks I'm trying to hide anything. And as Bruce said, an elected councillor on Cessnock Council in the Hunter Valley. Uh, and I'm also on the Local Government Association <coughs> Executive. But today I'm here from the Nature Conservation Council. So if we just go to the next one, that's Jeff, sorry. Um, and I think one back. Yeah, okay, so, and the next one. So just really, really quickly, some of you, I don't, I don't know how much people know about the planning system, so I'm going to assume um, not very much. And I'm just going to say, many of us uh, become aware of the planning system when there's a DA lodged next door, or we have to lodge a DA for some renovations or something like that. So really, really basically, we've got the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act. Of course, we've got regulations which sit under that. The important thing about the Act is that it allows for things called local environment plans. So we call them LEPs, and they set your zoning. So you know the commercial zone, the industrial zone, the residential zone, medium density zone, rural zone, uh, recreation zone. All of those things are set in the local environment plan. And then we have development control plans which sit under LEPs, and they have finer controls like saying you've got to you know, you, you need to be set back two metres or six metres or whatever from the, uh, your boundary frontage and, you know, maybe if you're in a heritage zone you've got to have colour bond of some description on your roof. All of those finer controls, some, some places only let you plant native plants, etc. So you have this series of planning documents and then you put in a DA or someone puts in a DA and a DA can be for a single dwelling or a DA can be for a shopping centre, or a DA can be for something truly huge. So if we go to the next one. So the DA is put, unless it's a, a barbecue or a carport, a DA usually goes on public exhibition. That means um, you can go and view all the documents, sometimes on the web, sometimes at the council offices. The neighbours get a letter, and depending on your local council, <coughs> Uh, notification policy, it might be lots of neighbours or just the ones whose boundaries actually touch the affected land. And normally you get two weeks to four weeks to make a written submission. Um, and then after that the council makes an assessment, you can attend a council meeting, you, um, you can talk to council staff. Uh, if it's going to a full council meeting, you can speak at the council meeting. Next one. So to give you an idea, City of Sydney, they have a, a, a tiered level of um, exhibition times. So for things like doctors' consulting rooms, smaller industrial development of less than 500 square metres, home industry, it's on display for 14 days. And you have 14 days to make a comment about that development. And you can see how it goes up. Uh, change of use um, of your corner store, sex industry, Someone who wants to extend their trading hours beyond 10 p.m., it has to go on exhibition for 21 days, and if it's larger industrial, 28. And if you go to the City of Sydney webpage, there's a huge list of every sort of development you can imagine. So the next one. So what happens then is that it gets, once it's been on public exhibition and you have voiced your opinion, the council um, or the consent authority makes a, an assessment. And there's some really important things here to know about the current Act. Importantly, the current Act includes, in its objectives, 
ecologically sustainable development. So everything in the Act has to be read from the perspective of ecologically sustainable development. So the natural environment, the social environment, and the economic environment have got to be harmonised. And it's, it's not, you just have to think about them. It's like a three-legged stool. If we take, if we damage one, the stool will fall over. That's the concept of ESD. And importantly, public participation. Because this act comes out of the 1970s, right? It's a 1979 act. So the whole 60s and 70s social revolution about people having a say in their community produced the act. Kelly Force campaign and the, the Rocks campaign in Sydney in particular. The next thing I want to point out is the assessment. Section 79C of the Act is a really important section because it says that you have to take into account the zoning controls. Remember we talked about the LEP, whether it's uh, re commercial or residential, what's prohibited and what's permitted. has to take that into account. has to take into account the development control plan and it has to take into account your submissions. And even more importantly, it has to take into account the public interest. You know sometimes there are things which you go, okay, it meets the objectives of the zone, it sort of complies with the DCP, but it's not in the public interest. There are sometimes developments like that, and 79C allows the council, the state government, whoever the planning authority is, to say if it's not in the public interest, we can refuse it. So that's, that's where we are now. So if we move on. So that's, that's for 30 years we've had that, a bit over 30 years. What we've got now is the New South Wales Green Paper. And it's come about because everyone knows the previous Labor government uh, were unpopular. Part of the reason they were unpopular is the planning system, the loss of public confidence in the planning system, particularly with Part 3A and the perception that uh, it was all slanted in favour of development and not in favour of residents and the environment. Um, the ICAC said that Part 3A in particular was a corruption risk because so much power was funneled into uh, one person's decision making discretion. There was also a political promise to return planning power to local communities and um, not have it so centralised. So, I want to step through the green paper really, really quickly. Here we go. So, there's an emphasis right up front on public participation. There's also an emphasis on making, on speeding up development. That's no surprise to anyone. But I want to emph um, draw your attention to this emphasis on public participation because it is really illustrative of the cleverness of this green paper. Because what it does is said, we're going to have you view public participation and it's going to be right up front at the strategic planning stage. And everyone will get their say at the strategic planning stage. And then after that, we press the green button, we press the go button. So it's so there's there's a twin thing happening here. Public participation up front on strategic plans, but once we've done that, there's a sort of um, attitude of development as of right. So if it's something that's permissible in the zone, then you can expect to have it developed and a much greater use of code assessment. So if we move on. So the whole brain paper is built around the notion of uh, three levels of strategic planning. Regional growth plans. So you might be familiar with the Sydney Metropolitan Plan. That's a very big plan for the whole of the Sydney Metro Basin. There's a North Coast of New South Wales plans, a Hunter plan, a South Coast plan. These are regional plans. So they're going to be renamed regional growth plans. Then sub-regional plans will be the plan that delivers the zoning. So instead of your council putting it, having an LEP and determining zonings, they will be determined by sub-regional delivery plans. Now, a sub-region, the city of Sydney is effectively a sub-region. However, eastern Sydney, I think you have Waverley, Wallara, Botany and Randwick council areas are one sub-region. So if the government follows that pattern, you can see that the, these sub-regional plans will be zoning land on a much bigger scale. And then local land use plans. So we do the next one. Uh, 
Now, one of the things that the Green Paper is saying is when we do these strategic plans, this regional plan, which says we need X number of houses in Sydney, X number of jobs, etc., it will take some time for the sub-regional plans and the local plans to catch up. So a development proponent can go to the state government, go to the Director General, and say, I want a strategic compatibility certificate. And that strategic compatibility certificate will say, this is development that's envisaged in the regional strategy, and therefore we're going to give you permission to do it. Do you see what I mean? This regional compatibility, strategic compatibility certificate will override all our existing LUPs and our planning mechanisms and will be based on this sort of notional idea it makes the broad regional strategy. We do the next one. So I just want to focus on sub-regional plans. Remember I said that these are the plans that are going to be the real engine room of the planning system that will deliver these, the, the zones that we're used to. So the green paper says it should be made clear that any development proposal that conforms to the standards and requirements in the plan will go ahead. Okay? Now you're going to be consulted on this sub-regional plan and the regional plan, and the paper gives as an example um, council's community strategic plans. Now my council in Cessnock has a community strategic plan. We engaged in community consultation. On one meeting we had 10 people turn up. I don't know if you've been participated in the City of Sydney's community strategic plan, but the example that the Green Paper gives is that is the type of level you will, you will be consulted at. And after that, you will need to accept these regional and sub-regional plans. And they will determine development. Next one. So to give you an idea of what we mean by um, setting the strategic planning and then increasing code accessible development. Uh, code accessible development, if, if you can think of a template, so if your, your single dwelling meets a certain template, your industrial building meets a certain template, it will be able to be approved in 10 days and you won't know it's going up until you are told that building is about to start next door. Okay? So, What's, this is a diagram from the green paper. You can see that something fits entirely in the envelope, it gets the go ahead. 10 days of time. Something which has little bits sticking out of the, uh, the template might be an extra story on top, might be a few too few car, park, car parking spaces. Then it will get the tick to the extent it complies and it can only be merit assessed on the extent to which it doesn't comply. Next one. So, if, you've, if you can sort of um, take in that idea, how am I going for time? Not very well. Um, if you can take in that idea that um, the, the strategic plan, if something's compatible with the strategic plan, a development proponent can get a certificate from the Director General of Planning and proceed with the development even though it is currently prohibited. That's alarming enough. But I want you to focus on this one for a minute. What the Green Paper literally says is that if market conditions change and the sub-regional plan no longer provides desired development outcomes, a proposal can be lodged anyway. So if you're living in a residential area, and someone wants to put commercial bulky goods retail there, the developer needs to say, well, I think there's a market for it. And that the council will have to consider that development. It's a very different situation from what exists now, where with our zone set up what's permissible and what's prohibited. Next one. One of the proposed new zones is called an enterprise zone. Now, this zone, these words are literally from the green paper, are char characterised by very little, if any, development controls. Okay, so if you can tell me what exactly that means, I'd like to know. 
But it, it seems open slather to me. It seems at least in principle it's an open slather idea. So very few development controls, regulatory controls, etc. in the enterprise zone. And it's clear that they're also thinking of that not just for business in the sense of enterprise, they're thinking of it for housing and mixed use development. Next one. Uh, one of the almost the only good thing that I can find in the green paper is the idea of a suburban character zone. And the suburban character zone allows development which adversely impacts on local character to be precluded. My perception of this is that the um, current uh, Premier, Barry O'Farrell, has his experience in Turingai where the community was so outraged at the intensification of development there and the bulldozing of some of the old houses um, that has spurred him and his government to put in a character zone. Next one. So, Spot rezoning. We all know about spot rezoning where there's a proposal to change the land use permissible to, to put in some commercial, some industrial, some high rise. So my question here is why would you need spot rezoning? Why would you need spot rezoning anymore? Because the whole slant of this new planning system is that nothing is prohibited. If you say the market's changed or there is a market demand, you can launch the development application. <laughs> Next one. So, the ICAC submission to the Green Paper um, talked about this vagueness and this, um, the idea that there are no prohibitions. And it said the Commission believes that subjective and ill-defined criteria are inherently open to varying interpretation and consequently provide a convenient cloak for corrupt conduct. Now, I think it's really ironic, because if you remember that slide I put up that what spurred the Green Paper, one of the things was the loss of confidence in the planning system and the assessment by the ICAC that particularly Part 3A um, presented a corruption risk. And here we are, just at the Green Paper stage, and the ICAC are sort of pointing out that you're actually heading in the same direction. It's a very, very disappointing result from a, um, you know, a, a planning initiative which held such high hopes. So, next one. So, this is my conclusion. That this green paper is focused um, very much on property development and speeding up development. It undermines environmental protection by taking out those measures of BSD, etc. And even though it talks up public participation in those initial phases, what it actually does is seeks to cut out public participation at the pointy end. And my belief, in my opinion, is the largest reduction in community participation since the Act was brought in. <coughs> and I think. My next slide is my last one, is what you can do, and that's jump up and down. So I beg your pardon for running through things, but that's my take on it.